this time, our future pastor will take the podium. Praise the Lord, Bethel. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's good to know that Jesus reigns, amen? Yes. We serve a mighty God who reigns, who reigns, who is in control, who is in charge, who has all authority, who's always in control. He's never not in control. He's never not in control. You know, so when we go through the ups and downs, the highs and lows of life, we serve a God who we can call on, who's in control of those, those highs and lows, those ups and downs. We serve a God who reigns and he's consistent. In spite of how our situation fluctuates and changes, our God is consistent. We serve a supreme God, a ruler. And just because he reigns and he's on the throne, it doesn't mean that we don't have a part to play. It doesn't mean that he does all the work and we just sit back and, you know, wait to be ushered into glory. We have a part to play, a responsibility to carry out. Amen? So today we'll be looking at a, a little bit of that. Today I'll be coming from the book of Mark. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Mark 10, verse 46. When you have it, say Amen. Mark 10, verse 46. <clears throat> you guys have it? Yeah. All right. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bar Timaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up. He is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go on your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Followed him on the way. From this portion of text, Today, I'd like to talk about the cost of sight, the cost of sight. Dear God, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for the service and how you've ministered to us and blessed us, Father. So I pray that as your word goes forth on this morning, Father, that you would bless me and that you would uh, just bless what I've studied, bless what I've prepared, Father, and you would bless the hearts of those that are listening, receiving this word, Lord, that you would do what only you can do, do what needs to be done, hide me behind your cross. Thank you and praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so the cost of sight. The cost of sight. So there's a term, uh, the term woke, right? Woke. It's used to describe, uh, usually but not always, just an individual, someone, maybe a minority, who understands that, th that this racial construct that we know or that we now live in and exist with is just that, a construct that was created uh, kind of like a hierarchy of sorts and that society uh, follows it with the understanding that not all races are necessarily seen or treated as equal within that construct, right? You guys follow? Uh, James Baldwin, James Baldwin writes and he says, to be a Negro in this country and not to be relatively conscious is to be, excuse me, to be a Negro in this country and to be 
relatively conscious, is to be in a rage almost all of the time. All of the time. So we could switch today's word woke with, that word, with those words relatively conscious. So to be the Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious or woke is to be in rage almost all of the time. Uh, that's, that's just the way it is, the way we view and see society now. When you, you kind of ever speak with someone and you realize that they, you're woke yourself, you're relatively conscious yourself, but this person kind of just lives and breathes it each and every day. And you realize, okay, this is probably all of your conversations at the dinner table are going towards race, race relations. All of your conversations, you know, in this are going towards this. And not that that's not an important thing and that matters in the eyes of God, because it does. But this person has almost like a burden of sorts for it, right? These people have almost like a, a, a burden of sorts for it because they've been woke. Their eyes are open. And now that they see things, it influences the way they live their life. How do you get woke, so to speak, or, or socially uh, conscious or aware of the racial construct that's going on? Well, it's not something that you're necessarily born with. You go through life and these labels and systems are handed to you when you go through life and you experience some sort of racism or you go to school and you hear about certain things that went on in the past and you realize, okay, well, this is the way this system is built up and then over time your eyes begin to open and you begin to see these constructs and see these systems and as a result, you can choose to either just deny it and say, you know, not, everything's fine or realize, okay, there's a problem issue here and something needs to be shifted. Something needs to be changed. You go through a series of things that allows you to see. And now that you can see, you have a, a choice of whether or not you need to live, you want to live differently. The same thing, we're talking about, yes, racial constructs and these things, but the same thing applies for us spiritually. The same thing can be said of us spiritually. There's a cost to having sight. There's a cost to having sight. So let's look a little bit deeper. Verse 46. 46 says this, and they came to Jericho. Where'd they go to? Jericho. They came to Jericho. And as they were leaving Jericho, as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples, a great crowd, and, and a great crowd, uh, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. Was sitting by the roadside. Now, before I go on, I just want to throw out an interesting fact that I found while I was researching for this. How many of you are familiar with this story? Okay, a decent amount of people. Um, my whole life I was kind of calling this guy, you know, blind Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus. And I finally do some digging, do the research, and realize, just a fun fact, that Bar in, in Aramaic, one of the original languages that the, the Bible was uh, uh, spoken and written in, uh, Bar is uh, Aramaic for the son of. The son of. So basically this is saying... Bar Timaeus, the son of Timaeus. See what I mean? That's not necessarily his name, but that's what he's referenced as here in Scripture. The son of Timaeus, okay? So this guy comes up, and we realize, okay, we don't necessarily have a, a true uh, a definition or understanding of what Timaeus means, but we see Bartimaeus, Bar Timaeus' situation, the son of Timaeus, his situation. What, what, what was going on with him? He was blind. He was blind, and also we see that he was a beggar. He was blind, he was a beggar, and he was sitting by the roadside, sitting by the roadside. So we see back in Jesus' time, there wasn't a, you know, a rich class, a, a middle class, and a poor class. You were either rich or you were really, really poor, trying to make ends meet from day to day to day to day. This man lost his sight. He lost the ability to work. He lost the ability to try and make ends meet from day to day to day to day to day because the resources that we have available to people now were not there back then. So he had to be reduced to sitting on a roadside, blind Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus. Oh, there's the son of Timaeus. There he goes again, begging again, begging for money because he could not see. Because he could not see. So we're going to go on to verse 47. But before we go on, I want you to repeat after me. Use what you've got, what you've got. To, get what you to get what you need. Use what you've got, what you've got. To, get what you need. to get what you need. Verse 47. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You see, he couldn't see, but he could hear. He could hear that, oh, it's, it's Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth that, that's, that, that, that's walking by us, Jesus of Nazareth. 
He heard that Jesus was coming. When he heard, he used his voice. He couldn't see, but he could shout. Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, the son of David, have mercy on me. And in doing my research, reading this commentary, I heard something interesting. They said, the son of Timaeus cries out to the son of David. The son of Timaeus, whom we have no real context for, or understanding of his, his particular situation other than seeing him in the present, cries out to the son of David, who we have all the context for. The son of David, the Messiah, the one who would save Israel from their sins. The son of David, the promised one, the one who would eventually later sit at the right hand of the father after he laid his life down for the people in their sins. Cried out, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. On me. So obviously, Jesus' reputation preceded him. Bartimaeus said, I've heard of this man. He's healed people. I've heard of this man. He's done incredible things. And now is my chance. Now is my chance to get my healing. Now is my chance to get my breakthrough. Now is my chance to see my change. Now is my chance to actually see. Now is my chance to get everything that I've wanted. Now is my chance. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He asks for mercy. He asks for mercy because he knows he's fallen. He asks for mercy because he knows he's not perfect. He asks for mercy because he knows he needs it. Have mercy on me. This brings me to my first point, the first of three. The first point is this, the cost of sight. Your sight is going to cost you your feelings, so flex your faith. I had a sermon a while back called Flex Your Faith. I figured I'd just throw that in there. Your sight is going to cost you your feelings, so flex your faith. If you're looking for the resolve or how that works, then it's coming. Here we go. Flex your faith. So he calls out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 48, what happens? Do the people say, oh, great, excuse me, Jesus, somebody's trying to get your attention. Here he goes, come to him, come to him. No, no, no. Verse 48, it says, and many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But, but, whenever you're reading scripture and you see a but, it's very important. It's okay to look. It's okay to study. It's okay to be like, all right, what does this mean? Because look, the but, there's always a contrast. There's always something different than, 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 than what happened before. So they're trying to suppress him, trying to suppress his voice, trying to keep him silent. But he used that opposition as an opportunity. And instead of letting it confine him, he cried out all the more. All the more, son of David, have mercy on me. On me. I was reading, doing research again, and it said this. It said they tried to make a blind man mute. He was already blind, and they tried to shut him up. They tried to suppress him. Could be for multiple reasons. They said uh, uh, one of them was maybe because he was too loud disturbing them. They rebuked his volume. But one of the things they also maybe rebuked was his theology. Because the son of David was seen as this Messiah, was seen as this one that would, 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 would come and take away, you know, all these, these, th- these things and these sins. And perhaps they didn't agree with his theology. So they said, Jesus, son of David, no, we know he does great things, but don't take it that far. Be quiet. Sit down. So they tried to shut him up. And you see, they don't understand the reason behind his, his, his press. They don't understand the reason behind his shouting. People won't always agree with you, but you have to press anyway. People will, people will say, oh, why are you doing that? It doesn't take all that. Why are you crying out to God? Why are you fasting? Why are you doing these things? Why are you trying to, 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 to get his attention? What are, you, what are you doing this for? Why are you going to church here for? Why are you doing this? Why are you reading this? Why are you, why are you going so hard? It doesn't take all of that. But they don't understand your situation. They're not in your, they're not living in your shoes. They don't know what you need. You see, Bartimaeus knew what he needed. He knew what he needed and he knew who to go to. He knew who to turn to. So he said, look, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. One of the other things I see is that uh, the last time in Scripture... Last time in Scripture, what city were we in? Okay, good. You guys scared me for a second. Thank you. Jericho. We're in Jericho, right? And so the last time we were in in, in Jericho was all the way back in Joshua, all those years ago. 
before Jesus showed up in the flesh, before Bartimaeus was even showed up in the flesh, before all this took place, we were in Jericho with Joshua. And the Israelites screamed, yelled, a loud shout, and the walls came tumbling down. Bartimaeus yells all these years later. All these years later, a loud shout tears down his inhibitions, tears down his pride, tears down the walls that say, oh, I'm not going to yell. It's okay. Tears those down, yells, and gets his healing. Which lets me know God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Just because he did something in one area of your life, in one situation, don't say, oh, that's over, that's done with, he can't do it again. He can do it again. He can do it again and again and again. Do not limit him to that one victory. Do not limit him to that one triumph because he can have triumph over and over and over and over and over again in your life. We serve a living God. We serve an active God. Hallelujah. We serve a caring God. We serve a strong God. We serve an almighty God. He didn't pass him by. He didn't pass him by. He could, Jesus could have kept walking. He could have kept walking. But you see, he saw uh, 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 Bar, uh, Bartimaeus' uh, press. He saw Bartimaeus is saying, you know what? Even though they're telling me to be quiet, I know what I need. And I know who's here, and I know what he can do for me. So because of that, I won't let them shut me up. Because of that, I'll scream all the more. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It gets Jesus' attention. It gets Jesus' attention. Barnabas had that no matter what they say type of press. Too many of us stop because of what they say, but they haven't been where you are. They don't need what you need. They don't see what you see. Verse 49 says, Jesus stopped. It got Jesus' attention. Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up. He is calling you. They're saying, look, be encouraged. Be encouraged. Get up. He's, he's calling you. The amazing thing about this is I, I read this and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Some of the people that said, wait, get up. He is calling you. Take courage. Were probably some of the people that tried to shut him up. Which means they weren't with him when he was down and out. But when they see him on his come up, they want a piece of the action. When they see him on his come up, they want, they want a piece of the pie. So they say, look, let me, let's, let's help you up. Let's help you. Come on. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. Some of them were maybe genuine, but others I'm sure were saying, be quiet, be quiet. And then Jesus, the one they dismissed, says, I want him. And they say, him? Oh, let, let, let's, let's help him. Let's come to his aid. So many people that are maybe going to kick you while you're down and out. They're gonna, that are going to try and keep you down. And then they see the hand of God moving. And then they're going to rush to you. Rush to you for some assistance. Some of that assistance may be, may be valid, but just use that discernment and realize that you can't always trust people. You can't always depend on people. Because Bartimaeus had to have a, a, a no-so. I know this. I want this. I need this. Despite them trying to shut me up, despite them trying to keep me quiet, I need this. And then they came around after his press. Your press will open doors. Your press will have people see things that they couldn't see before. You see, they had perfect sight, but they couldn't see what Jesus saw in, Bar in Bartimaeus. His press allowed them to see it. His press allowed them to say, wait a minute, there's something about this guy that Jesus wants. Let's assist him when they were just trying to dismiss him before. So you have to flex your faith. You have to flex your faith. You can't just say, oh, you know, they're, they're kicking me while I'm down, so all right, I'll just stay here. No, 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 no. Jesus, son of David, I know what I need. Have, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. So Jesus stopped, and he says, call him. Call him. You see, the thing about Bartimaeus is he didn't have sight, but yet by faith he saw his healing. And the people that dismissed him had sight but couldn't see his healing because they didn't have the faith he had or the need that he had. 
Sometimes you're, it seems like you're in your struggle all alone. But it doesn't mean that God doesn't see you. Sometimes it seems like you're the only one pressing in for what you're pressing in for. But that doesn't make it any less valuable. That doesn't make it any less attractive to God. God sees that press and called him forward. He saw his healing before they did through faith. So the first point is going to cost you your feelings, so flex your faith. So flex your faith. The second point here is it's going to cost you your comfort. The cost to sight. Sight is going to cost you your comfort, so cast your cloak. Cast your cloak. Verse 50 says this. Throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. He sprang up and came to Jesus. Now, more than likely, he had some assistance getting to Jesus. Maybe Jesus was walking toward him, and he heard him and stumbled the rest of the way, or maybe someone who actually truly cared helped assist him get to Jesus. But we do know he got to Jesus. He threw off his cloak. He sprang up and, and, and came to Jesus. Look at his posture. Jesus says, call him, call him, let him come to me. His posture is one of eagerness, is one of anticipation, ready, throws his cloak off, gets up, springs up, one of energy. Somebody who's been sitting there begging, lethargic, just give me some funds, please, I need to make it through the day, something I need, I need to make it, suddenly has a, a burst of energy, a burst of hope, a ray of light, hits him. He gets up and comes to Jesus. But look what he left behind. Look at what he cast it off. He cast it off his cloak. His cloak that was probably with him through the coldest of nights. His cloak that was his comfort. His cloak that he probably wrapped up in a pillow to, as a pillow to probably lay his head on so he didn't have to sleep on, the, on, on just the bare ground at night. His cloak that he probably used to, to keep his hands warm when it got cold out. His cloak that he probably used to wash his, wash his, his hands with. His cloak that he used. His cloak that he was maybe known by. Oh, there's blind Bartimaeus wearing that cloak again. Same cloak he was in five months ago. Blind Bartimaeus still begging in that cloak. Let's, let's tiptoe around him so he doesn't know we're here. There he goes wearing that, that same old cloak. It's all right. He'll, he'll make it up someday. He'll, he'll, he'll get over it someday. He'll get a new one someday. But that cloak was his, his comfort. That cloak maybe became his identity or attached to his identity. He says, I need this, coat, this cloak. This cloak is what keeps me safe. It's what keeps me warm. It's what keeps me from catching colds. It's what keeps me in the night. I need this cloak. Who am I without it? Who am I without it? But when Jesus called him, when Jesus called him, he cast it aside, his cloak. Why? Why? Because he didn't need it where he was going. He didn't need it where he was going. And he didn't need it with what he was getting. You see, the cloak was a comfort to the blind man, but in a few seconds from then, he wasn't blind. He needed the cloak in his blindness, but when Jesus restored his, or gave him his sight, he didn't need that cloak any longer. He said, look, I'm blind Bartimaeus no longer. I'm casting this cloak aside. Yes, it maybe served me well. Yes, I relied on it. Yes, it did some, some good things for me and got me where I needed to be. But I'm, I'm going to be a new creation in about two seconds. God's going to do some great restorative processes in my life to make me whole. I'm going to get what I've been praying for, what I've been seeking for, what I've been pressing for in two seconds. So I have to let that cloak go. I have to cast it aside because I can't take it where I'm going. You see, it, it's tied so wrapped up to my identity because I've worn it for so long and it's brought me comfort and some good things, but maybe I've leaned on it a little bit too much and now I have to learn to lean on Jesus. And it may be not be, maybe it's not a sin, but it's a comfort. And comfort sometimes keeps you somewhere too long. See, so keeps you somewhere too long and you stop from progressing because you're too wrapped up in your comfort. So Bartimaeus cast his comfort, his cloak aside and said, Jesus, heal me. God says, look, I want you to get beyond this point, but you have to get rid of that cloak. You have to get rid of that comfort. You have to get rid of that thing. 
And for many of us, all our cloaks are different. They're all different colors. They're all different sizes. They're all made of different material. We all have a different cloak that we maybe are thinking of or that God has pointed out. But whatever it is, God may be saying to some of us, look, you, you can't, you've relied on this cloak for so long, but you can't take it where I want you to go. I want to do something new in your life, and you're trying to bring the old thing with you. But put that aside and let me do my work. Let me work with you. Cast the cloak aside. It's going to cost you your comfort, so cast your cloak. And Jesus says to him, verse 51, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. It's like, Jesus, really? You speak to this man who's, who's blind, and you see his struggle, you see his situation, and you say, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? And he says, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. That phrasing there is like, Jesus, look, let me. You're in control. We just sang, you reign, you reign. Did a, did a wonderful dance to you reign. Jesus reigns. He shall reign forever and ever. He's in control. Let me restore my sight. It's up to you, oh God. You're in control. You ever have a moment when you know that things are going to change? Where you know that from here, from this point on, things are not going to be the same. Things are not going to be as they were. That moment that came, Bartimaeus knew on the tip of his tongue was exactly what he wanted. And the one person who could make that come true said, what do you want me to do for you? He had been blind, begging, begging, begging. And finally, the one person comes worth begging to, worth imploring of, worth asking of, worth getting his attention. He gets his attention. He gets his attention. He stops moving for him, comes to him, and meets a personal need. He says, what is it that you want me to do for you? He says, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And this brings us to the third and final point, which is it's going to cost you your freedom. It's going to cost you your freedom, so follow him. It's going to cost you your freedom, so follow him. Verse 52, Jesus says to him, go on your way. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you whole. Look at how Jesus heals him. Your faith has made you whole. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Look at how Jesus heals him. Jesus speaks a word. The word speaks a word, and this man is healed. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was this word that was in the beginning that spoke and said, let there be. I saw this meme going around where it says, God said, let there be, and it was lit, right? So God says, let there be, and everything that we know comes into play. Everything that we know comes into existence. Then later on, this same God, clothed in flesh, Jesus Christ, speaks to the winds and the waves and says, you're doing too much. Just relax. Peace be still. And the waves and winds say, I know this voice. It's familiar. It spoke to us in the beginning. It formed us. And so we must be still. And the same voice, Jesus Christ, speaks to death, speaks to death, to Lazarus' death, and says, release this man. Lazarus, come forth. Death has no choice but to open up its clutches and release Lazarus from its grasp. Death says, I have to obey. I must release. He releases, and Lazarus comes forth. This same man speaks to this blind man and says, go, your faith has made you well. And immediately his sight was restored. Jesus says, go on your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight. And he followed him on the way. The first thing Bartimaeus did with his sight was follow his healer. The first thing he did with his sight was follow his healer. Bartimaeus, Jesus said to him, go on your way. But then through him being healed, Bartimaeus' way became God's way. Bartimaeus' way said, you know what? I, I don't want to go man. I want to follow this man. Because of what he's done for me. Because, he, because of how he's healed me. Because of how he's changed me. I want to follow him. So after he's healed, he follows Christ. Follows Christ. Now, very quickly, I just want to add some, some uh, extra strength to, to these points. How can we flesh this out, right? The first point, flex your faith. 
Flex your faith. It takes, it takes practice. It takes practice just like a muscle. If you don't go to the gym, if you don't work out, if you don't eat right, if you don't do whatever you have to do, your muscle will just get weak and just exist and not grow. Faith is just like that. The more it's used, the stronger it becomes. The more it's used, the stronger it becomes. But the only issue that we have is our faith is used through opposition. Through opposition. Flex your faith. You have to see, like I said, the the opposition as an opportunity. Bartimaeus was crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. They tried to shut him up. But instead of shutting up, he cried out all the more. Many of us cry out to Jesus, have this opposition, and let it win out and say, oh, you know, maybe God didn't hear me. Maybe, you know, maybe I should be quiet. Maybe they were right. Maybe I am being too loud. Maybe I am being a bit, maybe I am doing too much. Maybe it really doesn't take all that, you know? And we let the, 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 the words and, and deeds of others silence us. For some of us, it's maybe not the words and deeds of others, but the thoughts that we have that, of ourself. God, how could you heal me? How could you grant my request? How could you bless my finances? How could you bless this? How could you save my children? How could you uh, make me whole? Because my prayers aren't even worth hearing, God. God, look at what I've done, the wrong, how, how wrong I've treated you. Look at how I've behaved myself, God. There's, there's no way you hear me. There's no way, God. I want, I want to restore my sight. I want to be made whole, but I'm too far, God. It's, it's, there's no way. Those oppositions, we have to, that, in those moments, that's the opportunity where we can flex our faith. Look at the opposition as an opportunity. Look at it as an opportunity. We need to have an inner resolve. We need to have an inner resolve that says this. I want things changed more than I want them to stay the same. I want things changed more than I want them to stay the same. Now, that's, it's easy to say that, but do you mean it? Do you mean it? I want things changed more than I want them to stay the same. That requires some soul search and some digging. Do we really want this change? Do we really want this change? It's going to take some prayers, some scripture reading, some worship music, some daily reminders that, look, I am blessed. I am more than a conqueror. I am victorious. So we need to flex our faith. Secondly, with cast your cloak, a practical application here. He threw off his cloak. He sprang up and he ran to Jesus. Comfort kills us. Comfort is good, but if you stay in the same place too long, you will die. So this, clo- this cloak, while comfortable... If he didn't cast it aside, maybe he couldn't have gotten that blessing that he so wanted because of what the cloak represented. The cloak was for a blind man, but he was no longer going to be blind. The cloak could be what's hindering us or holding us back. We need to, as the word says, lay aside every weight that so easily besets us. Someone reminded me after the 730 service that uh, my grandfather, the founder of the church, had this saying where he said, uh, uh, don't hold, don't grasp your cloak of life too light, too tightly. Don't grasp this cloak of life too tightly because it's, it's all temporary. And the things that bring you comfort, the things that you run to, you may be okay with that in one season, but in this new season that God's trying to take you into, you have to let it go. You have to let it go. If you have sight, why would you wear the cloak of the blind man? If God's here to restore your sight and take you somewhere else, take you on a new journey, take you on a new perspective, give you new insight, give you new depth of information, and here you are with your cloak. God, I'm ready to receive. What's that in your hand? Oh, it's nothing. I'm ready to receive. What's that in your hand? Oh, it's nothing. It, it helped me. It helped me, you know, while I was going through tough times. It helped me. It did this and did that. And God says, but I have something new for you. I have a new design all mapped out. I have something new, and I want to give that to you once I restore this sight. But you have to let that comfort and cloak go. So let that cloak go. Cast off the cloak. Uh, Thirdly, uh, as the band and the the worship team comes up, follow him. Some practical ways. Uh, Bartimaeus made made God's way his way. Made God's way his way. Um, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. 
now I see. So he made God's way his way, and now that he sees, the question then is, what is he going to do with his sight? What is he going to do with his sight? Uh, uh, our Reverend uh, uh, John Sherrod, um, I remember years ago when we would, you know, help him with different projects and things, he'd say, you know, hold this hammer, son, or tell these nails, son, or do what you got to do with this, son. And uh, he'd always ask you, he'd say, now, what are you going to do with those nails, son? And he'd be like, oh, well, you know, I was just going to do this. He'd be like, no, 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 son, here's what you do. Let's correct you. So in that same spirit, I'm going to ask you, what are you going to do with that sight? What are you going to do with what God blesses you with, with what you've been praying for when you finally receive it? Are you going to follow him or are you going to go your own way? Keep your eyes on the prize, right? Keep your eyes on the prize. Like, that's so essential. It's a phrase that we all know, but we have this sight, and we need to follow where Christ leads. We get the sight we've been praying for. We get the insight. We get the things, and sometimes we just go our own way right after God's blessed us. Part of me, could have been like, look, God, thanks. Thanks for the sight. I'll see you. Bye. But he chose. He resolved. Look, I've been blind for too long. I'm going to follow this man. I'm going to follow this man. In the same way, we should do the same. Who will we follow? Because we're always following someone. And this isn't on, you know, follow on Instagram or anything like that, or Twitter or something, but who are we following? Who are we chasing after? Bartimaeus' sight was restored. And so for us, we need to keep our eyes on the prize, on Christ. If we're having trouble sustaining, speak with someone. If we're having trouble, look, look to the word, read the word. Or if we're having trouble, put on some worship music, Flip, fix your vision, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and what the things of this world will go strangely, gent, strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Perhaps we're focusing on the wrong things once our sight is renewed. So too many of us, we get what we need from God and we go back. We need to honor God. We need to surrender God and we need to surrender to God and we need to live for God. And the thing about sight is it looks differently for everyone. When your eyes are opened and, you know, you're spiritually woke, it looks different. For some, it's, okay, I realize that now I'm a son, that now I'm a daughter of God. That was mine. That was my, that was my thing. I didn't really, really know. I understood it conceptually, but I, I didn't really grasp what it meant to be a son of God. What does that mean to be a son or a daughter? What rights and privileges come with that in the kingdom of God? How do you carry yourself as a son? How do you carry yourself as a daughter? How does that look practically? I didn't grasp it, but once my eyes were open to it, my whole perspective shifted. For some of you, it may not be that. For some of you, it may be, look, I need to see myself that I need to realize that I'm not a victim, but I am a victor. I need to truly realize that I'm not defined by my past mistakes, but God has redeemed me, reshaped me, renewed me, because every day I'm fighting these thoughts of the enemy saying, you can never overcome your past. Some of us need that sight to realize, look, he's lying. We're walking in darkness, but no, I am freed. I am redeemed. I am whole. I am made new. And some of us just need a physical healing, actually a physical touch from God. And there's many others that I haven't listed, but you know what yours is, wherever you find yourself on that spectrum. You know, and as I close, the biggest hindrance to some of us receiving our sight is that we cannot get past our feelings, anger, inadequacy, shame, bitterness, lust, and we can't flex our faith. For others, the biggest reason why we can't fully have our eyes open is because we're coming to Jesus with our cloaks. And Jesus says, take your cloaks off, cast them aside. For some of us, the reason why we can't keep our eyes open is because once Jesus opens them, we follow our own way and do our own thing and follow someone else. So wherever you find yourself on that spectrum, wherever it is, we need to follow Jesus, who is the way, who is the truth, who is the life. There's a God who is willing to heal, willing to restore, willing to renew, willing to cleanse. And willing to help us understand that there, there comes a, a, a cost with this sight. So wherever you are in this room, if you've been tracking with me this whole time, and you know you're in need of a Savior, you do not know Jesus Christ, and you want to come to know him today, you do not have a relationship with him, and you want one, you do not, want, you do not have a relationship with him, and you want to be with Jesus. 
You're walking spiritually blind right now because you don't know Jesus. But there's a light for you. There's a light for you at the end of that tunnel. You've maybe been trying to do it on your own and been stumbling, but Jesus is here to help you. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I will ask you to be honest with yourself and raise your hand if that's you. Is there anyone here? If you do not know Jesus and would want to have a relationship with him, anyone, raise your hand. Just be honest with yourself. If you want to change, you want to make a change in your heart, make a change in your life, and you want to come to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. If that's the prayer of your heart this morning, if you want a relationship with Jesus Christ, I'll ask you to raise your hand. Is there anyone here? Thank you for your honesty. Thank you so much. I bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? You want a relationship with Jesus? You want to come to him? You want to make a change? All right, God bless you. My sister who raised your hand, I'm going to ask you to take one more bold step and come forward, please. Thank you for your honesty. Let's praise the Lord as she comes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you so much, Lord. Everyone standing. I'll ask everyone to stand. Thank you. Thank you so much. Listen, if you're here once again, and you were to go to sleep tonight, you were to go to sleep tonight, and you would wake up in eternity if you were not going to see Monday, and you don't know what's going on, you, you, don't, you don't know where you'd be if you want to be with Jesus Christ. There is opportunity. The altar is open. All you need is a step of faith. Jesus said to, to uh, Bartimaeus, your faith has made you whole. You have that opportunity today. If you do not know Jesus Christ, I would ask that you would remain standing while those who do know him take their seats. Anyone? All right, thank you. All right, my sister, I just thank you so much for your honesty. Downstairs as well. My sister, I thank you so much for your honesty and your vulnerability for coming forward. You haven't come to me, you haven't come to the church, but you've come to Jesus, and I commend you for this bold step. I'm just going to pray for you, and she'll take you to the side and speak with you. Dear God, I just thank you so much for your daughter. I pray that you would be with her. I pray that you would strengthen her. I pray that you would give her that resolve, Lord. I thank you for her honesty. I thank you for her truth. I thank you for uh, her coming back to you, Father, her coming to you, her realizing her need for a Savior, her need for salvation. I pray that you would bless her, be with her, keep her from the hand of the enemy, and do only what you can do in her life. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. So, you're here, and you heard this message, and you know Jesus. You know, you obviously didn't come up for the altar call, so I'm assuming that you know Jesus. If you do know Jesus, but you find yourself in, this, in any one of those situations, one of those gaps, you realize, you know, like, I, I need to flex my faith, a hindrance, because, you know, I can't get past my feelings. You realize, you know, I, my eyes aren't fully open because I can't let go of this cloak. This thing I need to let go of, you realize I, 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 every time God opens my eyes, I keep doing my own thing. Wherever you are in that spectrum, if you fall into any one of those categories and you realize that you need to strengthen your sight, I'm going to ask you to come forward. If that is you, under the, the, in the kingdom of God, and you want to come forward because, you know, I'm not seeing 2020 right now. And I need to strengthen my vision. I need to strengthen my sight. Under God, if that's you, come forward, come forward, come forward. There's no shame. There's no shame. This is a safe place. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Begin to give him praise. Thank you, Lord God. I thank you, Lord, for your sons. Thank you, Lord God, for your daughters. I thank you, Lord God, for your people, Lord, who need you, who know they are in need of a Savior, who know they are in need of a Redeemer, who know they are in need of someone to help them receive that sight, Lord. I thank you that they won't go back, God. I thank you that they'll drop their cloaks, God. I thank you that they'll flex their faith, oh God. I thank you that when the enemy comes in to try to quench their voice, the enemy comes in to try to keep them down, the enemy comes in to try to suppress them, oh Lord, that they will rise up, oh Lord, in boldness, that they will rise up, oh God, 
in, in victory, that they will rise up, oh God, in truth, that they will rise up, oh God, in, in the authority that they have as sons, the authority that they have as daughters, the authority that they have as men and women that you have called into your kingdom, oh God. The enemy will get no victory. 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 Praise him like you know your victory is on the way. Worship him like you know your victory is on the way. He needs to hear you. 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 Hallelujah, God. You are worthy, God. You are worthy, God. This is the confirmation that, Pastor Rod, I'm, I'm going to just ask that you would just, just not leave. The Lord gave a word in the beginning of the service that confirms everything that Pastor um, Rod said. And this is what the Lord says. I am full of compassion. I am full of compassion for your heavy burdens. I am touched by what you feel. And I died for this. You will go home today differently if you allow me to be your bomb in Gilead. You are not meant to carry this kind of pain, my children. Some of you have been like camels, carrying pain, carrying hurt. You are not meant to carry this kind of pain. I am the remedy, says the Lord. And so as Pastor Rod was praying, some of you have been carrying stuff that you have no business carrying. You're his children. You're his children. And if there's anyone who's left who still needs to come, there is a powerful prayer that I believe that Pastor Rod is going to pray. And you are going to get your breakthrough. Get, don't go home. He says, today is your day of deliverance. Don't go home. He says, today is your day of deliverance, says the Lord. Why? Because he's full of compassion. Why? Because you are his children. And you are not meant to carry this. Bartimaeus was blind. And he knew there was only one way that he could get his sight restored in that moment. For those of you that are carrying that burdens that you're not meant to carry, think of yourself as Bartimaeus. Think of this prayer, this moment as Jesus being here. His presence is here. Your healing is here. Your deliverance is here. Your breakthrough is here. Do not let him pass you by. On the count of three, I want us to scream, to yell Jesus' name, and then I will go into a prayer. One, don't let him pass you by. Two, today is the day for your victory. Three, let's shout Jesus!
your people, Lord. I thank you for your sons, for your daughters, God. I thank you for their victory in Jesus' name. You've heard their call. You've heard their cry. And now you say, come forth. Come forth. Come forth. And you ask them. You ask your sons. You ask your daughters. You know, but you want to hear them. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? He's releasing it into the atmosphere. Whatever you need, he's releasing it into the atmosphere. Finances, your need is being met. Health, your need is being met. In Jesus' name, what do you want me to do for you? Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, because you are a good God. You are a God that cares about your people, Father. You are a God that sees our affliction and doesn't leave us there, but restores us, oh God. And today is a day, today is a day of restoration. 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 Today is a day of victory. Today is a day of empowerment. Today is a day that the Lord has made. Today is a day that the Lord has made and on this day you will receive your victory and on this day your hope has come and on this day all that you have pressed for all that you have longed for all that you have fought for is yours in Jesus name lift up the name of Jesus hallelujah seats and not only to our seats but as we leave from here and go back to our homes as Bartimaeus left up expecting that healing left up left up left up and discarded his cloak expecting that change I need you to walk back with a sense of victory a sense of purpose a sense of anticipation knowing what he's done knowing what he's gonna do knowing how he's moving knowing how he's gonna move I need you to believe it, saints of God. You are sons and you are daughters of the Most High God. You have authority through the blood of Jesus Christ. So God, once again, I just thank you so much for each person here, Father, for all that you want to do in and through them. This is just the beginning, just the tip of the iceberg, God. We thank you so much, God, for your investment, God, your investment, God, in each person's life, Father. Each time you spared them from the jaws of death, each time you spared them, God, from negative or crazy situations, God. And we thank you that you are a God of restoration and a God of renewal, Lord, that just because they've messed up doesn't mean you won't have mercy, oh God. So I thank you, God, for restoring, for lifting up, for keeping and cleansing. We pray all these things and we declare our victory. Declare our victory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Hallelujah, Lord.